Welcome to Film Forum Presents, a podcast featuring special live events recorded at our theater in downtown Manhattan, along with newly recorded interviews, conversations, and intros. We at Film Forum join the rest of the world in mourning the passing of Representative John Lewis on July 17th. Lewis was a giant of the civil rights movement and a true American hero. In this episode, dedicated to his memory, Film Forum presents an interview with filmmaker Don Porter, whose acclaimed documentary, John Lewis, Good Trouble, is now playing in our virtual cinema at www.filmforum.org. The conversation with Film Forum's Deputy Director, Sonia Chung, was recorded on July 10th. Greetings, Film Forum presents listeners. I'm Sonia Chung, Deputy Director at Film Forum, and I recently had the pleasure of talking to filmmaker Don Porter, whose latest documentary, John Lewis, Good Trouble, we are currently presenting in our virtual cinema. The film tells the incredible story of the late Representative John Lewis, a tireless warrior for civil rights, from his beginnings in rural Alabama through his many pivotal roles in the civil rights movement, including the Nashville Student Movement, the Freedom Rides, the March on Washington, the Selma to Montgomery March where he was beaten and seriously injured by the police, and the passage of the Voting Rights Act, all followed by over 30 productive and progressive years in Congress representing Georgia's 5th District. Don Porter is an attorney turned prolific, award-winning filmmaker whose social justice-centered work includes the acclaimed Netflix miniseries Bobby Kennedy for President, the Peabody Award-winning Trapped, which follows the struggles of frontline abortion clinic workers in states facing controversial regulations, the Sundance Prize winner Gideon's Army, which follows three gifted young public defenders, and Spies of Mississippi on the state-sponsored effort in the 1950s and 60s to preserve segregation. Her current project is on Obama-era White House photographer Pete Souza. I hope you'll enjoy our conversation. Welcome, Don. Thanks so much for uh, for talking with us. I know you're so busy. The film is doing great. Congratulations. Thank you. We are doing our best. We're making yeah. it work. <laughs> right. You, and you say that I, I hear the I hear some of that fatigue around well <laughs> in this situation. So I want to actually start with that question, sort of the uh, the obligatory, you know, how you're faring during during these crisis times question. But I want to ask it in a particular way um, to get a little bit about you in here, which is to say you are an extremely productive person. <laughs> you made- That is such four... a nice way of putting it. <laughs> I, I mean, you're, you're virtuosic. I mean, you made four documentaries and a mini series in seven years. So to me, that's, that's really kind of amazing. So given that, the question is, how have you been, what have you, been, how have you made um, this a productive time? Because I'm, I'm pretty sure you have. And I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, you know, um, well, first of all, I, I love what I do. And I don't take for granted that I'm able to do it. So every time I say, oh, I'm going to take a pause, or I'm going to do some like delicious story <laughs> comes up. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, you just kind of go into the mode of how can I make it happen? And you know, do it the best that I can. Um, So I have teenagers, I have an 18 year old and a 16 year old. Mm -hmm. Um, So we are in, you know, we've all been together and a husband. Um, So we basically, we just like fight for the best Zoom space. You know, work has always been um, a way for me to, you know, to, to, um, to keep control of my life to some extent. And um, so during this, this time I've been promoting a John Lewis movie. We finished the movie in December. Um, so we were done and it was really all about delivery. I have people I love that I work with and they all just kind of, you know, we transformed to a virtual delivery process. So we, we started figuring that out. Um, and, but then I'm finishing a movie about Pete Sousa. So I'm going to release two movies in the pandemic, Wow! Um, which was not the plan at all. But, you know, nobody makes a movie by themselves. So, right. you know, I think all of us are appreciative for the work and for the distraction that the work finds. And work provides me in particular with a sense of normalcy. 
Um, you know, it's so I have been living in, in San Francisco, but I work with people in New York. So we're used to working remotely anyway. So th- it was kind of a nice, stable situation to be able to dig into things, you know, creatively and, and occupy my mind for a little bit. But I'm not as productive as I normally am. You know, focus has been a hard thing. Um, also, kind of making sure my children are okay. You know, not only they had just kind of gotten feeling safe about going out with the pandemic and the virus, and then George Floyd dies. Um, so, you know, when you're a parent, you know, figuring uh, teenagers who don't want to be around you, figuring out how to make sure that they're okay, that that's occupies a lot of time. So, um, so for that reason, I like, I try and go out and walk with my dog, <laughs> but also like, I, I will say this, um, I have some really good friends who are quarantining near us and we've expanded our, our safe bubble so that we see each other. And uh, I don't think I've ever appreciated my friends so much as just that, like, we are social creatures. And, um, you know, I've really, that's what's gotten us through this is having some other people to laugh with and cook with and relax with and just enjoy each other's company. So those are, that's kind of what's been going on here. Yeah, that's a lot. I mean, the way you just sort of walked us through that, you know, the different layers of what to be coping with, it sounds like in in the process of making both of these movies, you were in a place where you'd finished shooting. So we, so not being able to, having to socially distance didn't prevent you from actually finishing your projects, which is great. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'd finished John Lewis movie, but Pete Sousa movie, I just did an interview yesterday. <laughs> I'm hoping to do one in the next four days. Mm-hmm. Um, so we definitely had, to, and then we started doing, so first we started with Pete, um, you know, and you could tell me if you want to, move on from this. But first we started with Pete. We sent him a camera set up because he's a photographer. He could kind of, you know, situate. So we, we tried that. And then recently people have felt a little more comfortable with people coming into their home. So I'm remote, but I have a local crew go do interviews and that's actually working out, you know, okay. I may never get on a plane again. <laughs> right. We're, we're learning. That's the other thing I heard you say is we're just, we're learning new ways of doing things that might, some of which might stick and might be better. We're learning things about community. You're learning how to make a movie, um, socially distanced. Um, but the part about the part in the middle about your, your boys at home and the George Floyd protests and just everything going on at once there, that's a whole nother layer of, stress but it sounds like you're putting that into your work which is good for us who get to enjoy the fruits of that labor right um well let me ask you a little bit about your career i know you've talked about this in other interviews that you came to filmmaking a little bit quote unquote later i mean who's to say when's when's late but you had a whole career as a corporate lawyer before and um you talked about you you were working at an abc news and you're watching journalists work and inspired by that. But I'm interested in when you first finally started producing films before you were directing them. I mean, there was a, t- a ton of sort of self-teaching to do, I assume. Um, did you just jump in? Did you learn a bunch of technical stuff? Did you have a mentor? I heard you once, I heard you say in an interview, you said, I don't do anything useful. I just have a good team, <laughs> which I thought was um, funny. Probably, I'm sure not true, but. Um, Um, You know, I started with what I knew. So um, a lot of producing is being organized, is being able to get deals in place, is being able to line one thing up after the other and organizing. And I'm very good at organizing, like, like being a lawyer, like you have to sequentially order your time. I mean, if you bill your time in seven to 10 minute increments, you learn time management and the value of time. So, so that was something I was, I was already strong at. And then really the experience of being at ABC, um, watching journalists take something complicated and make it comprehensible. I thought, oh, I can do that. That's also what a lawyer does. Cause I know, you know, the, the, vision of of a creative you don't automatically think of a a lawyer in a brooks brother suit as your like creativity impulse so you know the thing that i had to work on actually was letting go was not having things have to be perfect um i had to i had to really kind of push myself to 
to go with things and not, I'm a person who likes to get everything all ordered and lined up, you know, like I used to lay my kids clothes out the night before, <laughs> like I'm that kind of person. So you can't really do that in film. And you certainly can't do that if you juggle a number of projects. So, and you have to delegate and you have, and you have to, to delegate. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. that was something that, um, you know, and that is why I try and work with the same people over and over because I, and, and I also encourage them to step into their jobs. Like I had to step into mine. So, so there was certainly, but the one thing I think I'm not, I'm not the most technical person. And, and you know what I learned is that you should tell people the truth, you know, like I don't need to know like the codex, you know, I hired somebody for that. I do need to be able to, to communicate what I want. So I had to kind of learn to speak a language that the technical people could speak. But I think a lot of people, and particularly women and minorities, are afraid to look like they don't know something. Mm -hmm. They're afraid to look, you know, stupid or inexperienced. And, you know, my thing is like, ain't nobody got time for that. Like, mm -hmm. I I'm secure in what I can do, but ultimately also like I'm the boss. Mm -hmm. So like anybody who's silly enough to like mock me for not knowing like you know, anybody who hides behind jargon usually doesn't know that much. Mm, like, that's a great if, point. You know, if you are secure, you can speak English, right? You mm -hmm. can say, I would like it to be a little warmer. I would like close ups, like, you know, things that you're hundred percent clear about. So I don't find the need to pretend I know more than I, than I know. I love working with people who know more than I do about their, subjects and having them teach me enough to communicate with them. So, so this is actually a great segue into one of my other questions. I think you've just, you know, you've just described good leadership, the kind of leadership um, we all need and want and don't have right now. But this idea of knowing your strengths, knowing what you don't know, and especially being someone who's always learning and listening, and I just, I've noticed this about some of your films and your subjects, Bobby Kennedy, John Lewis, um, the public defenders that you followed in your first film, Gideon's Army. You are interested in good leaders. You're interested in what that looks like. Tell me, tell me a little bit about that. I think that's right. Um, you know, I'm, I'm interested in people who have made remarkable contributions, whether or not they are visible. Um, contributions. And, you know, many of us, uh, and I'm, this is certainly the case right now, are feeling like we want things to be better. We have a certain affinity for equality, for, for justice, but not everybody gets up off of the couch and does it. And so I've been like trying to explore through all of these projects, what is, what makes those people get up and, and step into, you know, these leadership positions? What is it that motivates them and what can we learn from it? You know, um, not everybody has to lead a mass movement in order to be a leader. I had my favorite hands down interview for a John Lewis movie with a group of kid critics and they were ages eight to 14. And uh, you know, in the question part, one of the little girls said to me, what can nine year olds do? You know, <laughs> and I just loved her. She was really serious and really, I, it was like challenging me to think of if you were a kid, what's within your, and so we kind of brainstormed it. And I said, you can be the nice person in the group. Mm. You cannot be a person who teases. If someone is being bullied, you can, you can help them. And, you know, we kind of came up with a bunch of things that nine-year-olds can do that actually make our society better. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm kind of always looking for that, like, what can some people who have achieved great things, and I include the public defenders in that, um, what, you know, kind of what can we all do? And, and I, I really love using film to work through that question. I was a philosophy major in college, like a, a poli sci and philosophy, because I think understanding, determining if there are universal truths and then understanding how they motivate us is like, that's really interesting to me. And that is, that examination of our commonality is really interesting to me. Well, what do you think John Lewis would say to that question? So 
John Lewis is someone who's, who's very well known. This is a question I have for you too. He's someone who's very well known, but also not very well known, which is yeah. just, we know him for one, we kind of, in the mainstream, we know him for one thing, which is that mm -hmm. he was beaten during yeah. the civil rights movement. He suffered physically, seriously for the cause uh, and has been in the movement ever since. That's the, sh that's the short version. And so that doesn't apply to most of us, right? Not most of right. us put our bodies in the line so when you take someone like that, what, what did you go into it thinking, I want to reveal these other things about him? Or was it more inductive? Was it more, I'm going to hang out with him and see what I find or both? No, I definitely, um, you know, and that is a difference between um, doing a film about people who are not well known and doing a film about a person like John Lewis who's lived 60 years in the public eye. So it, it is exactly what you just said, is when we celebrate John Lewis, often what we're celebrating is him physically putting his body in, in harm's way. And so I, I knew that there was much more to that story and what I wanted to celebrate in addition to that physical bravery and mental bravery and courage, um, was his strategy, you know, like John Lewis was a religion major, was a, was a philosophy person, person who studied philosophy. He went to divinity school. He organized groups and they planned for months and months before they ever stepped foot on a bridge. They had a really strong strategic plan. It's actually like political genius, you know, what they were able to do. It was the young people led by John Lewis and other, Diane Nash and some of the other Nashville students, Bernard Lafayette. Um, but they built upon a groundwork that had been laid by the older, by the adults, but they took it so much farther, these kids. And so I wanted to focus on the fact that they did training that they had plans, that they worked with a unity of purpose. There's a scene in the movie and footage, it's really affecting to me. The narrator describes as they're getting arrested that they were given a choice between $50 of bail or getting or jail. And, and the narrator says they all chose jail. That was not an accident. They intentionally determined that their the greatest impact they could make was all choosing to be arrested together and clearly was an unjust persecution on their part. So, so I wanted to focus on strategy. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also wanted to focus on the fact that he's here. He's a legislator. He's used all of the tools and, and skills that he honed as a, as a 20 year old. And he's still, he's still community organizing just from within the holes of power today. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I love that. Um, I love that idea of, strategy because like you said we think of him in terms of his body what he did with his body yeah. but meanwhile he's been i love that part about how he's been preaching the bible yeah. under his you know, <laughs> since he was a kid he would go to school with his little suit and tie and yeah. preaching um that's amazing uh and what did you what kinds of things did you learn about him that surprised you that inductive part of just hanging out with him um you know part of you know the public persona of a john lewis is usually these really fiery inspirational speeches he's he's got a very big persona even though he's a small man you know he's got a big persona but in private he's very quiet he's you know and, and i really respond to that because i'm i'm also an introvert extrovert like i i love people i love being in social situations but i also need a lot of recovery time and you know I'm very happy just being quiet in my house and, you know, just like puttering around and doing things. And he's very much, you know, we share that, you know, like he, we would come to his house, he reads the paper, he reads like three papers in the mornings. Um, he, he took me through like his sequence. He likes to read the New York Times, he reads Washington Post, then he reads local paper. Um, so he's a very thoughtful person. It, it, so it's not so much a surprise, but his process was a surprise to me. Um, how personal it is for him, you know, the things that he chooses to highlight. Mm -hmm. Right. Those sequences when he's reading the, the paper, I wondered, is that, it almost seemed performative because it was so methodical and meditative, but. Yeah, no, I think that that's how he, he, and he reads the whole paper, you know, like, like I, I, like I read the front page and then I go to like, 
you know, the, the style. Cause I like to read that. And then like, I read the real estate cause I think that's interesting. <laughs> and then, you know, I kind of, but he reads the whole paper, like really methodically. Um, a strategy you know. thing again. He's thorough. It is, it is. Yeah. And he gets, you know, all these papers delivered, you know, to his house every day. So. Let me ask you a question that I think maybe he would want me to ask, which is to get the message, his message out into the world. So he says a few times during the film, I'm worried we're going to lose our democracy. We're going to yeah. lose our democracy. So maybe this is the kind of the educational part of our talk here, <laughs> which is um, voting rights, voter suppression. Um, can you, without maybe getting too wonky, can you just, can you talk about Shelby versus Holder, um, the case that he um, is addressing right now <laughs> and, and sort of what he wants us to do in, in Georgia, but in general, yeah. So, um, it's really important to remember that John Lewis was present. He was a, as a very young man in his 20s after advocating for legislation to protect the right to vote. Um, he was present when President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act in the 1960s. In 2013, the Supreme Court uh, decision allowed states that had previously been uh, required to submit anytime they wanted to change voting, any uh, requirements related to voting, they had to submit those requirements to the Justice Department to review. It was called preclearance. And as a result of the uh, Supreme Court decision in 2013, Shelby v. Holder, they no longer had to do that. So essentially there was no one looking over, you know, the, the, the changes that would be proposed by Southern states that had a demonstrated history of discriminating against particularly African Americans, but really all minority voices. So after Shelby, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's very well known that and there was a North Carolina case re after Shelby that said states acted with surgical precision to silence and to disenfranchise particularly minority voters. And that's, um, minority voters of, of all races, of not just African-Americans, but of all races. And what you saw was this gerrymandering effort. You saw people who, you know, perhaps they came from a different country, perhaps they didn't, English wasn't a first language, ID requirements that you have, like certain immigrant populations did not have ID. So you know, they couldn't get, they couldn't certify their, their, they couldn't satisfy the requirements of, and their ballots would be, you know, their voting would be stripped and they'd have to, you know, you also have older people, you have people who were worried about being targeted for their minority status. So a number of, uh, of uh, laws came that really, and what happens is the laws could eventually be struck down but the process of going through the courts takes so long that by the time these laws were challenged effectively, the election would have passed and the damage is done. So we see in 2016, polling places shut down, long lines, people's ballots being changed. Um, I was on the ground in Ohio. We saw people who had voted at the same polling place for their whole life being told that they, had, they were supposed to go to another polling place. Well, if you're a person, who has to go to work and you've already got, made your effort to go vote, you may or may not spend another hour getting to your new polling place. So, so there, were all, there were all of these things that, that you know, taken together really did impact our, our ability to, to, uh, for people to effectuate the franchise. And that was even before we layer in Russian interference and meddling and, you know, those kinds of things. So um, we have, we, you know, and that is what the Congressman, he knows what it's like to try and manipulate the vote. And so, uh, you know, I think that that was a particularly painful period for him. That's why this film I think is so important and why John Lewis is so important. So that surgical precision, that's such a haunting phrase. It reminds me of your other film, Spies of Mississippi, where you actually, uh, exposed that there was a state commission that was <laughs> systematically trying to preserve segregation, right? So that surgical precision, it just, it tells us that it's strategy against strategy, right? That's that, right. That's why strategy. And here we are at this Black Lives Matter moment where there's a lot of protesting and there's a lot of noise being made, but well, I think what John Lewis would say is, but 
where's what's the strategy we need strategy that, that's exactly right that is that is exactly right and that is why i hope that this film speaks to people who are willing to take up the mantle from him you know i see like tamika mallory who's organizing black lives matter um marches i see other young leaders and you know I know from speaking with him how proud he is uh, to see so many people out in the streets. It, it really matters to him and is really gratified because his whole life he's been saying, if you see something, say something, speak up, speak out. And make good now, trouble. <laughs> make good trouble. And we see people doing that over and over. And it really, really, uh, particularly now is, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's been ill and it, it really matters to him. It really, it makes him feel like it's all been worth it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I have one more question for you and I have to get going. It's a little out of order. Uh, we'll see how it goes, but I, I'm just really curious about this. You are a, you were born in New York or raised in New York. You're a New Yorker, you're educated in the Northeast, um, but you've spent most of your time in filmmaking in the South. And I'm just, you know, we're at a time where it feels like we're, we're regressing in terms of this whole north south thing we see it with politics we see it with the pandemic it's very strange what do you what do you make of that uh, as a northerner having spent all that time in the south i think that um the difficulties we have with race which are certainly present in the north um are uh, a little hidden from view whereas the south has kind of reckoned with its racist past in a more overt way. Um, and so there are people, I, I found a number of subjects there who are really confronting, white and black, who are really confronting the legacies of racism and discrimination. Um, and so it's just been a really fertile place for me for, for storytelling. People are open and willing to talk. They've been thinking about it for a while. They know what they think. They know what they want to do. They know where they want to go. And I think in the North, we still have a lot of reckoning to do. You know, I think a lot of us were quite complacent and self-congratulatory um, in a way that was not deserved because we are now seeing um, it is not just people from the South who elected the current president. It is people from all over this country. And so racism does not respect a perfect, re uh, a particular region. Um, and I, I am, I will say though, very heartened. I don't mean to keep going to the South. They just like the good stories keep coming. Yeah. Um, but I am really, really heartened that this moment does feel different to me. Um, you know, and I've been studying kind of mass protest movements through the last 10 years, through the, the work that I've been doing, um, I see a different energy. I see a different intolerance for intolerance. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, particularly from kids um, who are, are really questioning and not allowing um, their parents to lead them down an incorrect path. So, um, so I'm very, it'll be very interesting to see the films that come out of this, this moment. Um, I also am seeing, um, you know, something that's really, really important, which is raising up the voices of so many other minority groups. You know, PBS just did, was a four part series on Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. Why have we not had that until 2020? Right. I mean, I just, soaked that in, you know, and, and I thought, oh, there's so many women in particular that I did not know were activists. And I didn't, you know, I didn't know the story of Patsy Mink. I knew that she was in Congress, but I didn't know her story. And so I kind of felt like a white person. I was like, <laughs> how come I didn't know this, you know? Um, and, and so I think all of us have some growing to do. And I, I think that's what this moment is challenging. It's saying like, let's open it all the way up, you know, like, uh, you know, my only quarrel with that series is like, it kind of mashed in Southeast Asians with, you know, I'm just like, okay, we can only get like, you know, <laughs> like, right. could we have our, our own series for, for Southeast Asians, but well, you know, it's, I can, it's the first pass, right? It's our first, it's the first yeah. pass. And, and right. And I, I should not complain because it was just so gorgeously done. Um, and, and really, but, but so I kind of, it was good for me to see though. So I hope to get out of the South. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the stories keep coming. I mean, what I love about what you just said 
you know, for our audience, we're, we're a New York uh, uh, art house cinema. And what you, what you basically said was, wow, we're actually kind of behind. We are behind. North, in the Northeast <laughs> where, we, where we think of ourselves as actually ahead, right? But that said, um, this is a moment when we're catching up. This is a moment when you're seeing those changes. Yeah, and when we need to yeah. continue to challenge ourselves to catch up. You know, and, and that's the, and instead of like pointing towards ignorant cultures, kind of look in the mirror and, and what do we need to examine? Um, you know, my kids have grown up in the Northeast and have been subject to the same prejudices that, you know, people experienced 50 years ago, doubting their intelligence, doubting, questioning their ability to get into college, like all that crap is happening here. Um, and particularly resources are scarce. It's hard to get into college these days. And that's where you see when, when people, particularly in the North are challenged, when their privileges are challenged, people aren't quite so tolerant anymore, you know? So mm -hmm. I, I challenge all of us and I include myself in that to look for our own blind spots. Right. Humility, self-awareness. We're all evolving. We're all learning. We are all learning. So. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dawn. This was great. Really appreciate your time. Really glad to be showing this film. And I'm so grateful to you for sharing this film and for oh, this sure. conversation. I really, yeah. I, I loved it. Great. Great. Take care. Okay. Take care. Thank you for listening to Film Forum Presents. Special thanks to Magnolia Pictures for making this episode possible. If you like what you just heard, please be sure to subscribe to get future episodes and rate and review so that more movie lovers can find us. Film Forum is an independent nonprofit cinema, and our doors have been kept open for nearly 50 years thanks to the invaluable support of our members and donors. Please visit www.filmforum.org for details on membership, as well as information and showtimes for our current programming. See you at the movies. <laughs>